Good afternoon and welcome to the Serious Security Seminar from Purdue University. Uh, our speaker today is a PhD student here from Purdue working with Professors Karthik Kanan and Jackie Reese over in the School of Management. Uh, Matthew's uh, research interests are in interdisciplinary looks at solving the issues of digital pr uh, piracy. Uh, his topic today is on that same subject, nudging the digital pirate behavioral issues in the piracy context. Matthew? All right. Thank you, Randy. Uh, and thanks for this opportunity to speak in front of this group. I really appreciate it. Um, and as we go along through my presentation, uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, hopefully I'll have the answer. If not, I'll jot it down and maybe I can get back to you. Uh, but this is ongoing research. And so uh, this is part of my dissertation. As Randy said, I'm a PhD candidate in the Cranert School of Management. And today uh, what I'm presenting is Nudging the Digital Pirate, and it's an extension of the theory of planned behavior. And this is co-authored with Karthik Cannon, who is also, he's a professor in management information systems, and Dwayne Wegner, who was here at Purdue, is now at Ohio State in social psychology. Um, the other paper in my dissertation is more of a behavioral economics type of paper. I won't be covering that today, but if you have any questions about that, if this piques your interest, uh, just please let me know. So just a quick overview of this presentation. Uh, I'm just going to kind of dive into some digital piracy um, kind of facts or just some findings, some motivation, uh, talk about my research questions, and then I will get into the theoretical development of my model and explain that as well as the background literature. Then I'll cover my research method that I've chosen for this topic and talk about the data that I collected. And then we'll wrap up with an analysis and discussion. And again, if you have any questions as I go along, just, just please uh, raise your hand and, and I'll, I'll call on you. So does anybody recognize uh, this company here, World of Goo? It's a 2D boy. It's an independent firm, two guys. Uh, I've spoken with them uh, through email, or, or chatted with them through email. Uh, World of Goo is a game that they released a couple years ago. Well, World of Goo is, was released without digital rights management, so it didn't have any type of technology protecting it. Um, and they claim about an 85 to 90 percent piracy rate. So, you know, we, it's, it's, that's a big number, uh, these big 90 percent. Well, okay, well... Maybe this world of goo is an anomaly. Uh, maybe it's not like that with, with other types of applications. Here's another example of a, another type of casual game. This is from Gamasutra.com. Uh, Machinarium, I, I don't know this game, but they claim 95% piracy on their full copy of their game. Um, again, this game was released without DRM, so it didn't have any rights management on it. Now, I mean, there's various reasons to release with or without DRM. Uh, these developers claim that you know, it's a hassle for their potential customers. That's obviously one potential issue. Um, and they, uh, they maybe don't believe it's the right approach for their audience. So let's take a look at another example. Uh, let's see. Here is Ricochet. Uh, again, I, Ricochet Infinity, I, I've not played this game. I don't know anything about it. They claim 92% piracy of their, of their product. Well, guess what? Um, <clears throat> they have DRM on their product. So I guess the point I'm trying to make, and, and I'm not trying to stop development of DRM or, or make any bad or, or good claims about DRM, but in the current state, DRM is not an end-all, be-all solution for piracy. Uh, there seems to be the same amount of piracy rates regardless of if it's, if it's there. Does anybody recognize this, this slide here? Anybody follow what's happened with torrents lately? Uh, just November 26th, the Department of Homeland, S Homeland Security, the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, cracked down on, I think it was 75 different sites and these sites were just search engines for torrents. They weren't actually hosting um, any illegal content, but they were allowing or, or facilitating p uh, potential pirates or consumers to get to illegal content or unauthorized counterfeit content. 
So the U.S. government shut down these sites. Well, guess what? In four days, November 30th, there's already a new way of getting around um, the domain name um, limitations that were put in place by Department of Homeland Security by you know seizing those domain names. Well, now the peer-to-peer -peer networking is releasing their own type of distributed or peer-to-peer -peer type of DNS um, to get around these anti-piracy efforts. So, jumping more into my topic, uh, my discussion today, it's clear it's, it's difficult to secure digital property rights. Uh, we all know this. Um, an example, just some statistics here. This first one, 4.6 million intellectual property lost on average per firm in 2008. Now this is not software or games, this is actual uh, in-house data that firms own. Uh, this was a study done by uh, Professor Cannon, Professor Reese, and Professor Spafford, uh, sponsored by McAfee. Uh, the second statistics here, uh, 50 plus billion dollars. This is an increase, I think it was 3%. Uh, this is the estimated value of unlicensed business software in 2009. That's by the Business Software Alliance. Um, now, I will make the claim, or I will assert that that 50 plus billion, that doesn't mean it's um, a one-to-one -one kind of 50 billion in say, potential sales. They're claiming that as an estimate of what the unlicensed software amount is. Um, I mean, basically, you look at it, um, not every pirate is a purchaser. So, we need to keep that in mind when we look at these statistics, but still, we're talking about a, a large sum of uh, dollars. So why is it difficult to secure these property rights? Well, take the example, uh, that first statistic, 4.6 million. Well, there's per, uh, potential geopolitical issues. Uh, there's enforcement issues across countries. There's cultural issues about property rights uh, in terms of, um, or cultural differences, I should say in terms of um, ownership of different types of digital media. Uh, there's also kind of this casual piracy, soft lifting. You know, hey, can I borrow your copy of uh, Microsoft Office so I can make a copy of it? You know, that's not distributed widely. Uh, it may not be distributed widely across the internet, but that's a, a type of casual piracy uh, where a firm like Microsoft may be missing out on a sale. So. There's a kind of a brief overview of some of the digital piracy issues, and, and this can be music, games, software, uh, movies, uh, any type of digital media. Um, but what types of strategies should management uh, use to address these types of issues? So that's kind of what the perspective that I'm coming at. Um, you know, should we make improvements in technology? Well, well of course, of course we should. Um, that's not the focus of my research. Perhaps that's the focus uh, of some of your research. But uh, could we also build our understanding of social norms or, you know, of our understanding of human behavior? And that's more of the perspective that I'm coming at. So, in regards to current strategies, current protective mitigating strategies that are currently being used, has anybody heard of uh, pirate amnesty? You guys heard of that? I thought it was really interesting when I saw that. Uh, I believe there were some... Um, some music producers that did this where they released their albums for free. I can't recall the name off the top of my head, but basically said, hey, here's our album, pay us what you want to pay. Um, the, st the same thing has happened with, you know, for example, that World of Goo game. Uh, they, just a while back, they released their product, name your own price, and you can get a legal copy. Well, of course, they saw their sales jump up, but uh, there were a lot of one penny type of transactions uh, just so someone can get amnesty for a, basically a free price. Uh, it was interesting though, they did release some statistics, internal statistics, that showed, I think the average price was about $2 that they were getting on their games, but there were some people that were still contributing the full 20, or you know, maybe even more. So it's quite interesting. So, what's another uh, protective strategy? Well, you have law enforcement, just uh, like those examples I gave you about Depart De Department of Homeland Security. Uh, there may be arrests, there may be shutting down of different sources of piracy. Uh, we also saw this, there was another example, it was in the Wall Street Journal um, about a month or two ago, where the Department of Homeland Security saw uh, 
I don't know, 35,000 downloads of uh, Sex in the City or something like that, one of those shows. And they saw that and they said, hey, this is hurting people. This is hurting the uh, people that do the sound crew and the lights and all these other people in Hollywood. It's not just hurting these corporate executives. Uh, now, we also have lawsuits. So RIAA, Recording Institute, uh, Motion Picture Association, uh, or Recording Industry, I should say. Uh, I know Purdue was a... Uh, big on their list in terms of targets. In 2007, I think we were ranked like number three or something like that on RIA's uh, list of schools to go after because the piracy was so rampant here. <clears throat> Again, I mentioned technology before, so perhaps improvements in DRM or other types of uh, anti-piracy technology. Uh, now, the last strategy is what I think that some firms are doing, such as 2D Boy, the world of goo company. Uh, and that's more of an education about piracy and they do that through information and, and different types of communication. So that may be discussion boards, support forums, uh, maybe interviews with uh, internet press. Uh, but basically they're getting out that 90%, hey, we're, we're at 90%. They're not uh, being uh, malicious about it, but they're saying, hey, this is what we're seeing. And uh, we use that as a motivation for this paper. So piracy, we claim that piracy may impact investment by firms in their products. Um, now, the issue with that is pirates, they believe the action is harmless. So, you know, how big of a deal is it if I, if I download one song? It's a dollar. It's no big deal. Well, what if all of us in this room download one song? Or all the potential listeners of this presentation download one song? I think Randy was saying that's, you know, a couple thousand. So, that's not just a dollar, that's thousands of dollars. Then you put that across all consumers and maybe they have multiple songs or hundreds of songs and thousands of consumers, millions of consumers and again we're talking this isn't really a harmless behavior anymore. Um, <clears throat> now there's costs associated with piracy deterrence. DRM cost, you know, there's capital investment that's required for DRM or other types of technology. Um, and another thing we claim, uh, we don't study this in this paper, but we claim that the quality of the good the digital product that you're going to that consumers want may actually be impacted. So if if developers know that they're not going to, uh, or that they're they're losing out on some potential revenue, they may not be able to invest, or they may not be able to justify the investment up front as they're developing that product. So we may actually have a, a reduction in quality. So as I mentioned, piracy is harm. You know, people perceive it as a harmless or victimless behavior, um, but we do see these. Uh, high piracy rates, the technology doesn't seem to be effective at this point, um, and as we know, there's a minimal chance of being caught uh, pirating. So, in this paper, what I do differently than uh, what's been done in the literature, especially in a behavioral study, is I define different stages of piracy. So I think there's a difference between someone that's in an initial purchase stage and someone who has already pirated and maybe willing to convert to a paying customer. Um, I saw some examples of this uh, perusing some different discussion boards, uh, email discussions through different, through different uh, developers where they would receive emails just out of the blue saying, hey, you know, I originally pirated your, your product, but it turns out that, that I like that product, I like what you guys are doing, and I decided to pay for it. So what's uh, the paradox there is that they're not gaining any economic utility by doing, they're not gaining any monetary, they're actually losing monetary utility by uh, becoming a purchaser, um, but yet they're still willing to do that. So what, what causes them to do that? Well, as I claim that piracy is a harmless behavior or a victimless crime, you know, uh, think about this example, uh, Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft has, I don't know how much money, um, does it, you know, do you think about how you're hurting Bill Gates and the stockholders of Microsoft if you're uh, getting a copy of Office? Probably not. I'm, you know, that may motivate some people to pirate. Um, but so, so is piracy really a white lie? Is it a harmless, victimless behavior? Um, what we claim or what we theorize is that, that actually piracy or the fact that it's a white lie uh, makes our morals. We know that piracy is a wrong thing to do. It's a social norm that that piracy is illegal. It's wrong. It may be unethical. Um, but we allow our morals to change because we think it's a harmless behavior. Um, 
And because of that, we need a way of mitigating that type of issue. So, and then as I, as I mentioned, you know, some pirates do convert to paying customers. Well, why, why do they do that? Are these, is, a, is a conversion decision different than an initial purchase decision? And that's something we'll look at here in just a moment. So in regards to the, uh, the theoretical development for this paper, um, this first bullet item here is, I based this study, the foundation of the study, on the theory of planned behavior. Now the theory of planned behavior um, has been around, I think, since uh, 86. Uh, Beck and Eisen, in 91, extended the theory of planned behavior for predicting dishonest actions. And what they did is uh, they included this, this perceived moral obligation component. And we'll see a model here in just a second, but uh, I guess the purpose really isn't to, ex to really explain the theory of planned behavior, um, but we know that it's a, it's a good theory, it's a sound theory for predicting um, different types of behavior. So intentions and then actual behavior towards, towards doing something. Um, this theory of planned behavior has been used in other piracy studies, so we are confident that that was a good starting point uh, since it's been published in the literature that the theory of planned behavior is a, is a sound, uh, accepted starting point. Uh, uh, Peace Galetta and Thong was one of the big ones that uh, helped motivate or helped to uh, build my study here, and I'll, and I'll get to that in just a moment as well. Um, the second bullet item here, and I don't, uh, you know, I have a lot more references, obviously, in my paper, but uh, I'm just hitting the main ones here in this slide. Um, but the second bullet point here is very important. So, Logsdon in 94 claimed that, uh, and had supporting evidence, that piracy as a behavior has a low moral intensity. Well, if you think about it, that parallels that, uh, that kind of behavioral economics topic that I mentioned about a white lie, uh, where piracy is a harmless behavior. So if it has low moral intensity, we may not feel that it's uh, a wrong thing. We may, we may not feel that guilt or those other moral implications when engaging in piracy. The third bullet point here um, is actually quite, uh, I like this paper a lot. Um, it's Mazar et al. Uh, 2008, and what they claim is that uh, honest people can be dishonest, especially when the consequences are minimal. And really what that paper gets at and helps build our theory is uh, that theory is called uh, uh, self-concept self maintenance, I believe. I need to look, look that up real quick. Um, but basically what that theory says is that we're willing to be dishonest as long as we can stay consistent with our self-concept. <clears throat> yeah, self-concept maintenance, excuse me. So we're willing to lie, even though we may be an honest person, we're willing to lie or we're willing to do something that we normally wouldn't do because we don't think it impacts um, our own self-concept. Um, and this last bullet point here, Cialdini 93, this is a book called Influence, and there's lots of references in this book. Um, but basically, there's these theories of compliance, con uh, consistency, um, and also the ability to override our own norms because we want to be consistent with the prior behavior. Now, if you think about the stages of piracy that I mentioned, you know, this initial purchase, this uh, piracy conversion. So if I'm a pirate in the past and I'm at a decision point now, you know, my desire to re remain consistent and justify my past behavior may allow me to do the same thing again. And that's really what we th why we think this theory is important to this paper. Now, of course, I have to mention, or, you know, we, we should always mention the uh, other issues that we should control for in this, that, this type of study, um, such as sampling, um, as well as the cost. Because uh, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, not everyone um, is going to buy every good that they pirate. And one of those reasons might be they simply cannot afford it. So we have to control for this expected utility, what they're going to get from purchasing, and also just what it costs and whether or not they're able to purchase. So we control for that in our study. Um, also, sampling. Um, some pirates may start out with the best intentions, and they may sample the, the pirated good, but they may not actually go and pay. So they want to try it out before they pay for it. So we also need to control for that in our study. Now this uh, image here, this is our model. This is the base model. 
of the theory of planned behavior for predicting dishonest actions. Um, <clears throat> now, we introduced this anti-piracy message as a moderator to this model. And we, use, we do that by, um, by using social impact theory, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But uh, what we see here, the, the three kind of bubbles here on the left are kind of standard theory of planned behavior, the attitude towards the behavior, subjective norms, that's what our peers think. Uh, and then the behavioral control, kind of the control issues of whether or not we can, we intend to do the behavior. Um, usually the theory of planned behavior has another component um, out here to the right. That's the actual behavior. Um, piracy, of course, is illegal. And uh, if we were to include actual behavior, uh, we, we would expose ourselves to quite a bit of bias um, because, you know, someone may be more willing to lie in this type of study because they don't want to admit that they're doing something illegal. Um, and so usually these types of studies, they, they, we go with intention, and intention is a strong predictor of actual behavior. Um, <clears throat> so again, we include this anti-piracy message, and we do that uh, in order to um, <clears throat> boost up this or change this perception of piracy as a behavior with low moral intensity. We try to remind people by sending this message that it's, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's actually hurting some people. Um, and then also, um, <clears throat> it reminds them that it's a kind of an, a wrong, like a illegal behavior. Now, the second model here is actually our main, one of our main contributions of this paper. We take the theory of planned behavior on the left-hand side, and we modify it, so we move perceived moral obligation as a mediator. Um, you can see it here in the top left of this figure. So, and then we have the red arrows pointing from attitude towards the behavior and uh, subjective norms. And what this mediator does is it, is it captures our uh, assertion that our morals can be malleable. Our morals can be overridden. Um, our morals can be influenced. Usually morals are, are kind of internally held and what we claim is that, no, in the case of piracy, and the reason why this, this change is, is required or, or is, is an improvement of this model um, is because piracy is a white lie, and we need to be able to account for that in this model. Otherwise, as an independent predictor, um, we don't believe it's, it's uh, capturing um, what's actually happen happening So, uh, wi with a, a, a pirate. And again, uh, as before, on the left side, we still include our uh, anti-piracy message as a, as a moderator. <clears throat> Are there any questions yet as we're going along? Um, I also include some controls uh, for the age of the subject as well as their gender. Um, certainly, there are, are lots of controls that we could have included, but consistent with the literature, those are kind of the two um, most important uh, controls to include. So, for this project, uh, we use the survey method, survey methodology. And for our independent variables, or these constructs, attitude, perceived moral obligation, subjective norms, perceived behavioral control, for those independent variables, uh, we use existing theory of planned behavior questions. Now, uh, they were developed by Beck and Eisen in 91 for that, their model. Um, Peace et al. in 2003 extended it. Uh, of course, Peace et al. did not have the moral component in their paper. That's also a, dif a differentiating factor that our paper has that theirs did not or that they chose not to include. Um, but Peace, uh, they adapted the, the questions that were originally developed, kind of these uh, general questions for the, the theory of plan behavior, and they adapted them for the piracy context. So we reuse questions that were already accepted, tested, uh, by the literature. Um, for our dependent variables, we develop uh, two hypothetical scenarios, uh, an initial purchase scenario and a conversion purchase scenario. And basically what they'll say, I can perhaps read a bit here for you. So let's see. <clears throat> For the initial purchase scenario, it starts out with you plan to acquire a software program for your personal computer that will prove useful throughout your studies. 
Um, in order to control for sampling, I mentioned that's an issue. Uh, we include a sentence here that says, you've previously used this program uh, on a friend's computer, but you need your own copy. So the sampling, we control for sampling um, by including that type of, of statement. Um, also, I mentioned that uh, cost is a potential issue in this type of study. And we include uh, in our instructions that, that the subject could afford it, but um, you know, it's not, it's a, it's a stretch. It's a stretch to afford it, but they could afford it if they chose to. Now in regards to a uh, conversion purchase, the question starts out with, you have a pirated software program on your personal computer that will prove th useful throughout your study. So it's basically the same question as the initial purchase. We just change it a little bit so that that person knows that that, that product was pirated. <clears throat> and they have to decide whether or not they're going to purchase it. Now I mentioned this, uh, this anti-piracy message. Um, what the anti-piracy message is kind of a general um, benign statement. It's not uh, attacking or making, trying to make people uh, standoffish. But, but basically what this question says is uh, your purchase helps the overall software industry, benefits our employees, increases tax revenue, and reduces job loss. And then you, know, you can, click, you can uh, purchase it from an authorized retailer. So it's a very general statement, but it's, it's designed to get at someone's morals. So they know that there's, there's uh, potential consequences from, uh, from not purchasing that type of software. Now these dependent variables, all of these variables actually are captured on a one to seven scale. Uh, and the purchase, the uh, purchase scenarios are the likelihood of purchase. So, <clears throat> um, so the, I just read the morally salient and a piracy message. Um, from a fictitious firm, and uh, we believe we justify that as a moderator because of, uh, I believe it's Latane, um, 1981, the uh, psychology of social impact, that uh, there may be influences from other places that may uh, change someone's um, perspective or influence their decision. So we distributed 218 surveys. Um, these surveys were distributed in uh, classrooms in the School of Management, the, the Craner School of Management. Um, about, well, about 218 were distributed. Uh, 198 were completed and use, you know, useful. There were some that were just blank, um, so of course we had to toss those out. But of the ones that were useful, we had 198, so it was a pretty good turnout. It was all optional. Uh, we didn't force anybody... Um, to do it, there wasn't any extra credit available. Um, there was no other um, mo motivation or incentive given to them, other than uh, just they knew we were doing a study on on piracy. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, uh, we include costs, sampling, controls, and then a, a age and gender as well at the very end of the survey. Um, what also what we do in this survey is that we change the order of some of the constructs, uh, and as well as the uh, the scenarios. So the initial purchase, conversion purchase, and then we change some of them so that they start with conversion and initial. And uh, the reason for that is we want to get at this consistency of behavior, this uh, whether or not um, they've done the right thing or the wrong thing in the past. And we can try to get at that with our study. So for our analysis, uh, I used uh, partial least squares. PLS is, is the shorthand. It's a statistical technique. And it's uh, used for path analysis. Um, there's other types. You may have heard of SEM um, or other types of structural modeling. Uh, this is a component type of modeling versus a covariance type of modeling. But um, partial least squares has been used uh, quite a bit in the literature for this type of study. Um, partial least squares takes advantage of bootstrapping. So uh, we resample uh, with 500 uh, different resamples each time I run. To, to determine if we have significant paths between the different constructs in the model. Um, and then, as I mentioned, as these, uh, these different stages of piracy, whether or not they start out with an initial purchase or a conversion purchase, we do some subsample analysis uh, to see if, that, if those stages make a difference. Um, <clears throat> we also, or I also uh, verify the results with more conservative techniques. Some people um, you know, may think that, uh, or may claim that PLS, because of bootstrapping, could take advantage of different levers to um, get the results that you want. Well, 
in order to say that, well, that's really not the case in this study, um, I also use multiple regression and various different uh, techniques um, like Moeller, uh, Baron Kinney, and some other different um, guidelines in the literature to run the same analysis and, and have the same result. So um, the results are stable. Uh, we also use different multivariate techniques such as factor analysis to make sure that our items that we ask are loading the way that we want to. And I'll show a table here in just a moment. Um, I also test for common method variance. Um, common method variance is, is basically uh, when the covariance is related to the fact that you had one subject answering the same questions, and so you're using this one technique, one subject, and so there may be some spurious covariance. Um, and so that can be an issue in the behavioral sciences or social sciences. Um, we don't believe that's an issue in this study, um, and I did a couple different tests, such as Harmon's uh, single factor test. Um, also used a, an unrotated uh, factor um, as a new latent variable that, that is, has uh, causal paths to the other endogenous constructs um, in the model, so such as the, dependent, the, the piracy intention, the dependent variable, and then also the perceived moral obligation. And basically when you do that, um, if there's a change in the variance extracted, then there may be some, some common method variance, and we don't see that in our data. Um, that's just a technical technique. I can explain that later if you'd like to know more about it. Um, but then also we see very low correlation between the constructs. So if there's a lot of, if there's very high correlation between the constructs, there may be some potential uh, common method variance. Um, there are other ways of controlling for common method variance or testing for common method variance, but uh, this is what I did for this study. So this table here, this first table, uh, this is uh, the factor loadings and cross loadings. So on the, the first column, the construct, you see attitudes, subjective norms, perceived behavioral control, perceived moral obligation, and piracy intention. The second column is the items. These are the questions. So the, there's individual questions that make up each construct. Um, <clears throat> and the point of this table is just to show that, so attitude, for example, you look at the bold numbers. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. The bold numbers across this diagonal. And we see that the items that are supposed to be measuring that particular construct, so A2, for example, is supposed to be capturing attitude towards the behavior. And here we see that it loads quite highly, 0.793, on the attitude construct. So basically this is a way of disc discriminant validity. So all the attitude items load with all the attitude items. You know, all the moral obligations load with all the moral obligation items. They don't cross-load on each other. Um, so this is just showing that that our data is, uh, that the questions, the scales are valid, um, that, that uh, our data is, is looking good at this point. Um, I do have one issue that we came up with is subjective norms. Um, it would be nice if it was over-identified with, you know, three items or more, three or more items. Um, but, and we, used, we reused items from the literature, but for whatever reason, our subjects um, didn't respond well to the, the third item there, and it, it didn't load as highly. Um, it still loaded, um, it didn't cross load on any other items, but we chose to exclude it from the study just because it, it wasn't uh, as reliable. Uh, this next table shows the uh, composite reliability, so kind of this internal consistency of the items. That's that second column. <clears throat> And uh, in the diagonal is the average variance extracted for each of the constructs. They're all very high. Um, we need those to be up above, I think, 0.7 or so is a good guideline for average variance extracted. And then we also see that the correlation amongst the constructs are, are all quite low. Um, the only one that's a little bit higher is uh, attitude and perceived moral obligation. But again, that's still, you know, it's still fine. It, it's not, you know, up to the 0.9 kind of level. Uh, it's at 0.66, so that's still good. And we would expect, I mean, these are behavioral constructs. We would, be, we would expect them to be somewhat related. We wouldn't expect them to be orthogonal from each other. Now, this slide here, uh, this is our PLS analysis. In all of these, uh, the next couple slides, uh, you'll see a path, you know, drawn from a construct and its cause uh, on the intention. Um, if it's a solid path, that means it's a, it's a significant result. If it's a dashed path, that means it's a not significant result or not you know, not statistically significant. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Generally, the, these are standardized uh, coefficients, so basically a one standard deviation change in attitude would result in a 0.242 standard deviation change in intention. Um, so all of these are standardized coefficients. Um, but generally, if we see something above about 0.2, that's mean theoretically meaningful. Um, so here's the original model, and here's our new model. Um, they load similarly, as we would expect. We do see a strong causal path from attitude to perceived moral obligation and also from norms to perceived moral obligation. So basically what that's saying is that our attitude is influencing our morals. Uh, it, our morals are changing because of these other constructs. But we do see a little bit of a problem here uh, in that this direct path, this path here from attitude to piracy intention, has a higher coefficient than the path from the perceived moral obligation. So you know, why? Why, why would that happen? Um, and if you guys want to answer that, you can, or I'll tell you <laughs> either way. Um, well, what we see, actually, uh, when I do my subsample analysis, if you've not pirated before in our hypothetical scenarios, the only thing that really matters to you is your attitude towards that type of behavior. And so attitude is more proximal to the intention. Um, however, if you've pirated before, you're, you're overriding your morals on this next decision that you're making. You're, you may not have done the right thing before, and now you're faced with, this, with the decision to do the right thing this time, and it's making your morals salient and important to you. Um, so, you know, if you've not done something bad before, and now you're going to do it, well, I didn't do a bad, I didn't do a wrong thing before, it's not, maybe not that big of a deal. Whereas if I did the wrong thing before, I have to really decide, am I going to do the wrong thing again? Um, and that consistency theory would say, well, you know, maybe they will do the same thing. Um, but what we find is that uh, <clears throat> these other constructs are, in fact, influencing um, your morals in those types of situations. Um, we don't see a significant result in this, in this full sample uh, on the anti-piracy message. It doesn't seem to hurt it either, so it's kind of benign. It's not making a difference one way or the other. But if we look at subsample, this is the main uh, positive contribution of this paper. Um, positive meaning this is how it is. Uh, so this is a, an extension of this theory. This you know, I mentioned the extension of the theory of planned behavior. Well, when someone's been a pirate before, when they've done something that's harmless, and now we're, we're, we're reminding them that they did that before, um, you see the paths that are now significant. Again, attitude strongly predicts moral obligation. Subjective norms, uh, weak, weaker, but still a significant a predictor of moral obligation. And moral obligation has a very strong impact on uh, the overall piracy intention. Now here was the issue before, was the attitude. Well, we've, we, in this subsample analysis, I've excluded that first group that started with an initial purchase. So they were never reminded of doing something bad. Um, now when we look at the people that were reminded of doing something that was you know, perhaps bad or making it morally salient to them, um, that is no longer uh, loading strongly or it's no longer has a strong influence. Now here, um, when we look at overall piracy intention, so this is both of the scenarios together as a, as a composite latent variable, excuse me, um, <clears throat> We do see that the anti-piracy message does have a moderating effect on the morals. So we have a negative sign, and it's a significant result. And so there is a, a mitigating effect of the anti-piracy message. So basically, when we do send someone a message, we sent it to half the subjects. The other subjects did not receive a message at all. So for those that did receive the message, it did mitigate this change in their morals. So it did make that a stronger issue. Um, I should say that a positive coefficient means going, uh, it's, it's moving with the piracy intention, so they're moving together. So if, if uh, for example, if a seven is, uh, it's not morally important at all to me, then the equivalent seven on intention would be, I'm definitely going to pirate it. I'm less likely to purchase it. Versus a one is strong moral obligation, and a one is, I would definitely, more likely to purchase. So when they're, when it's a positive coefficient, they're moving together. It's a negative, they're moving in an opposite direction. And this is what we would expect. 
Um, so perceived moral obligation is predicting the uh, intention, the overall intention, and we see this mitigating effect of our anti-piracy message. So I mentioned this is kind of the positivist um, contribution of this paper. Well, we also have a normative contribution as well because we're, we can give some policy guide, guidance to uh, firms about perhaps you know, ed doing what 2D Boy does, you know, kind of educating their potential consumers about piracy. Um, our control for age is significant, negative. So as you get older, you're less likely to pirate. It's basically what that says. And that's consistent with the literature. We didn't find a significant result on gender. Um, this slide breaks out the initial purchase on the left and the conversion on the right. So we separate those dependent variables into two separate models just to see if the stages are different. So if someone at an initial purchase stage behaves differently than someone at a conversion purchase stage before we looked at them together, this one looks at them separately. And we see that it's, it, they're quite similar. Um, there's really not that much difference. Uh, the main difference comes in with this message. Um, our anti-piracy message does still have that moderating effect when someone is at this initial purchase stage. So if they've pirated before, they're now deciding if they're going to purchase, that message is, is, a, is helpful in mitigating piracy. Whereas if they started out with an initial purchase, they didn't... Uh, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, they started out, their first question was a conversion question. Um, you know, well, I've already pirated it, so I may as well just keep it. That's kind of what that is saying, that an piracy message isn't really changing it. Um, again, our, we have a strong uh, theoretical uh, relation between attitude and perceived moral obligation, and also norms going to perceived moral obligation, and these paths to the dependent variable from attitude and subjective norms is not significant. So this is the, that's the result that we wanted to see, um, which is great. Um, <clears throat> so I have about seven, eight minutes left, but just a couple more slides. Are there any questions about what I presented so far, about PLS, about this type of model? Um, no, that's all right. So... In regards to the stages of piracy, now there was some analytical work done that looked at conversion decisions, um, but as far as behavioral, there hadn't been any work done. Um, but we find that they're motivated quite similarly, as that last slide showed. Um, but when we remind a subject of the stage that they're at, so they pirated before, then they're not, you know, they're making an initial purchase, um, that does matter. And we do find those differences in those models especially if you compare the subsample, you know, the full sample to the subsample. And then what I, how I explained the, uh, when we looked at the, um, the initial purchase first, all that mattered was attitude. So <clears throat> um, the stage matters, the stage of piracy matters. Uh, the moral implications of this study, well, you know, piracy, as I claimed at the beginning, piracy is perceived as a harmless, victimless behavior. Um, and... Uh, we, f we find that morals are, in fact, malleable under piracy. So we are changing our morals to be consistent with our behavior. We're overriding, you know, those of us that may pirate, uh, we're overriding what we know may be the wrong thing to do and doing it anyway because we think it's, our friends think it's a good thing to do or we have a good attitude towards piracy, something like that, even though we know it's wrong. <clears throat> and I should say, I don't, I, I don't pirate personally, but, I mean, I'm not, this is not motivated or uh, uh, I don't make any claims about what people should or shouldn't do. I'm just th this is what we're finding in our data. So just wanted to make that statement out there. Um, obviously, I'm trying to develop strategies for uh, management to use to mitigate these types of behaviors. Uh, now, sending that morally salient message, we do see that that significantly uh, mitigates the malleability of the morals and reduces that impact uh, on the purchase uh, intention or the piracy intention. Um, but to conclude, uh, piracy is a significant threat to producers. It will continue to be a significant threat to producers. Um, again, you know, one download doesn't mean one lost sale. Um, we have to keep that in mind when we think about our statistics. And uh, we think that we, you know, we can't convert everybody to be a a, a paying customer. Of course, there will, there will always be those that want to pirate or just won't 
won't have it. They just won't consume it. Um, in regards to piracy deterrence, uh, at this point in time, uh, I think most would agree that the technology that's being used is, is largely ineffective. Um, within days, um, software can be cracked or keys generated or uh, workarounds done um, towards uh, creating more, more piracy or more availability of pirated products. Um, you know, I, I even saw, uh, does anybody play Spore? I've never played that before, play Spore. Um, I guess there were some people, I read that some people had purchased Spore and then pirated it because the DRM was so troublesome. So I thought that was really interesting that, you know, you, you pay for it, yet then because of some issues with the video, video cards or something like that, it was actually easier to get the, the DRM, the product with the DRM removed, the pirated product. So I thought that was interesting. Um, in, this, in, this topic, in this study, uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, um, we make positive and normative contributions uh, with, this, with this study. So the positive contribution is that, uh, you know, since piracy is a white lie, uh, piracy can be rationalized, and that's that extension of the theory of planned behavior where perceived moral obligation becomes a mediator uh, instead of just an independent predictor. Um, the normative contribution is that the more of this pro-social behavior uh, can be influenced exogenously, such as through an anti-piracy message or some other technique. Um, you guys may be familiar with, uh, I think it was Madonna or somebody uh, in music, they would poison these peer-to-peer -peer networks with songs that had like swearing or some other types of angry messages. Did you guys hear about that? So you know maybe that's not the right approach. Maybe they should, if they're if they know that this uh, piracy is going to happen on these peer-to-peer -peer networks, maybe they should try a, a more benign or just an informative message rather than upsetting the people that are trying to steal their music or you know use it without paying for it. Uh, but there's some different policy issues that should be explored. Um, this is my contact information, so if any of you want to email me or have any other questions about what I've presented, uh, I would certainly, again, this is all research in, in progress, so um, if you have any suggestions or concerns or comments, I would uh, definitely appreciate them. And I think that uh, that concludes, unless there's any questions. Nope. All right. Thanks, guys.